Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, another ESGE webinar. Tonight's webinar is the impact of COVID-19 on training and endoscopy, getting your mojo back. My name is Ian Gralnick. I'm the Secretary General of the ESG, and I'm joined tonight uh, by my co-moderator, Dr. Andre Voisu, who is the chair of the I committee, which is the ESG Young Endoscopist Committee. And we are joined by a, a great group of panelists, and I think we're going to have a great webinar tonight for uh, everybody. So this is now the third year that uh, ESG is offering uh, the opportunity to have to, for you to uh, be a part of our webinars and view high-quality presentations on all different types of uh, hot endoscopy topics that are given by world leaders in endoscopy from around the world. And also that this is interactive. So if you have questions tonight, you can actually use the Q&A function on, the, uh, on Zoom to submit questions online. And myself and uh, Andre will be able to uh, uh, give those questions or pass those questions on to our panelists. And our webinars are all free, which is great. Um, so we're now calling this ESG Webinar Wednesdays. Uh, it's not every Wednesday, but on most Wednesdays now, uh, really through the end of this year, there are some great webinars that are scheduled, ESG Webinars. They take place on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Central European time. And you can actually go to the ESG website and look at the webinar cal calendar for what are the upcoming webinars. I, I want to make an important point here. Uh, for those of you who are already individual members of ESG, that's fantastic. Uh, but for those of you who are not, I really recommend that you uh, join the ESG as an individual member. Um, and if you are a trainee, if you're cur currently in your gastroenterology or endoscopy training period, it's really a great rate. It's 95 euros uh, a year to join the ESGE. You get great benefits. You're going to get the journal endoscopy, which, by the way, now is the highest rated uh, endoscopy-related journal in the entire world with an impact factor of over seven. And there's all these other benefits that, and I refer you to go to the ESG website. But, uh, you know, I joined joined actually when I was in training. I've been, been a member uh, ever since. Next slide. And for uh, those of you who actually, uh, there are now 23 of our member societies that have dual membership agreements with the ESG. And what that means is that if you join as an individual member, if you're not a trainee, there's actually a significant reduction in the price of joining. Uh, and I'll refer you to the next slide. It's a little bit easier to see. These are all the various societies, member societies of ESG that actually have dual membership agreements with ESG. And that means is if you're a member, let's say, of the Austrian society, you can join the ESG as a dual member for only 150 euros a year and you get all the member uh, benefits. So I highly recommend you uh, considering joining the ESG. We'd love to have you be a part of the family. And with that, I'm going to turn over to my co-moderator, Dr. Andre Voisu. Andre. Okay, thanks, Julian. It's very nice to be here uh, this evening, and hopefully you'll get a nice webinar out of it. So going back to it, today's webinar is, again, COVID-related, but it is dedicated specifically to trainees and their mentors. So of course, in the past few months, as the pandemic imposed uh, new, uh, new rules to the playbook, uh, fellows and residents have been deeply involved but also deeply affected by, by the changes so there has been a lot of disappointment and a lot of frustration and a lot of fear going forward regarding the impact this will leave on their performance and their career so of course to address these issues we'll have some very exciting uh, panelists but this is also we want this to be a very um, uh, involving uh, webinar and we'll go through a live voting. We'll have two questions now. And the first question is, during the past three months of your training, have you performed GI endoscopy as usual, significantly less than usual, not at all, or you are not in that position because you have not yet begun your hands-on training? So please vote now. You should get a, a window pop up and you just uh, click on it and then we'll discuss the results. Okay, we'll just leave that for a couple of seconds, but let's see. Okay, so 71%, that's a lot, say that there has been significantly less than usual activity in their uh, 
endoscopy units. And I have to ask uh, the, our co-panelists, Omar and Katarina, uh, you are also young endoscopists. Has this been uh, true for your units? Actually, um, in our unit is uh, significantly less uh, than usual. And also I agree with the uh, uh, vote, voting and I think uh, this is the case in uh, our center now. Yes, we have the same situation now in, in my center. The most of cases were significantly reduced, especially the basic and elective procedures, but uh, the most emergency cases were still, uh, still performed. So the same problem here. Yeah, so I guess this was uh, quite foreseeable. Now we move on to the next question. Let's see. Uh, during the pandemic, what have you done to supplement reduced hands-on endoscopy and access? have studied the literature, maybe you watched webinars like this one, training videos, other online events. Maybe you have access to simulators, animal models or mechanical or virtual, or you've been so busy, you've actually had little time to work on your endoscopy training. So uh, let's vote now and see uh, what your answers are. I have to say not everyone has access to simulators and we'll get back to this at the end of the, uh, of the talk. Sure, it would be nice. We'll see if anyone or if everyone benefits from simulators. And again, the majority says that they have watched webinars, which is, uh, which is nice, and they have access to online content. Again, studying the literature, I guess we're doing that on a regular basis. And unfortunately, 15% of, uh, of the trainees of the respondents have had little time to work on their training. And this is, again, a three, four months period. And as we're moving forward, it is, is going to be an even longer period of time where apparently there's been little work done there. Okay. And um, these are actually other results from a survey that the ESG has uh, uh, proposed to the members at the beginning of the pandemic. So this is very early on. And this is uh, actually published recently in the position statement, which I urge everyone to check out. I think it's very interesting and it gives guidance for the next period. And it also gives these results from you, the, the members. So the question was, how has COVID, the COVID pandemic impacted the endoscopy trainees in your endoscopy unit? Again, this is at the beginning of the pandemic. And as we can see, it was to be expected that uh, most of the trainees were either temporarily reassigned or were staying at home. And only a minority, 11%, were actually uh, carrying on their training as scheduled. An interesting fact is that 20% of respondents uh, have, have said that their trainees were continuing their training as scheduled, even if they were not performing endoscopy procedures. And we're going to come back to this point uh, during Professor Avanitaki's presentation because we have to understand training encompasses more than just technical skill. So this is, I think, very important. The next question was, if you believe the pandemic will affect endoscopic skill acquisition in trainees. And again, it was uh, at the beginning, but everyone was, or mostly everyone, was convinced there will be quite a significant impact on skill acquisition. Uh, just 10% of respondents thought that their trainees or themselves won't be affected. And moving on, uh, this is actually the moment where I introduce the rest of the panel. As we've heard, uh, we have two young members for the first time in a webinar, Dr. Omar El Sharawi and Dr. Katajina Pavlak, which are uh, members and colleagues of mine from the uh, I committee. And of course, Professor Mariana Arvanitakis, who will uh, end the presentation with some uh, tips and tricks regarding getting your mojo back. And now Omar will uh, present the results of his survey. Thank you, Andre, for a uh, nice introduction. And um, I would like, uh, one second. Yep. I would like to thank uh, Ian and Andre for organizing this webinar. Uh, in the next few minutes, uh, I will be presenting the preliminary results of a survey uh, conducted about the uh, endoscopy training in the era of COVID-19. Uh, our survey um, included 1,309 participants from 11 countries uh, from Middle East, uh, mostly and North Africa. 48% of the participants uh, were advanced endoscopists uh, in training for advanced endoscopy. 
Uh, interestingly, 80-80% were males, and I think this is anticipated in such region, and also in the speciality. Uh, here, uh, the map we can see uh, showing the distribution of the participants from 11 countries, and uh, mainly they're from Egypt, uh, Turkey, Morocco, uh, some some from Iran, Algeria. Uh, as we can see here in this slide, uh, we ask the participants about the type of procedures they do, whether the type of uh, procedure uh, emergency or not, uh, means selective, that they choose necessary but not emergency cases. And uh, as we can see, 61.2% of the participants answer that they, they do uh, the emergency uh, cases only. And uh, we asked them also uh, what kind of the guidelines they adopt to uh, select the cases. And as we can see here, 65.5% were uh, the national guidelines uh, assigned by the national societies uh, in their countries. Uh, we here can see that uh, industry training and the workload, uh, and the, uh, in addition to the follow of cases, is important to guarantee the acquisition of the uh, acquired endoscopic skills. And as we can see here, uh, the average number of procedures per month in 2019 and in the same months in 2020 during the pandemic. And uh, we can see the average number of procedures were significantly decreased by almost 48% in general. And in some months, as we can see here in May and April, uh, showing the decline by more than 55% than uh, the same months in 2019. And also, it's uh, noteworthy to say that 74% of the participants were deployed for uh, COVID-19 wards and ER uh, rooms. For in our analysis, also, we uh, asked the, we, we found that the average working personnel in the endoscopy units, including nurses, endoscopists, assistants, technicians, were significantly decreased by 59%, as they were also deployed to uh, either other departments or uh, COVID-19 wards and the ER. We uh, also asked the participants about uh, if they are con uh, continuing training during the pandemic in their unit or not. And unfortunately, we have 70% of the participants reported that the endoscopic training has stopped during the pandemic. It's important to look also who, uh, who were answered yes, so this is 30%. And actually, 78% uh, of the people who, or the participants who answered the, uh, that they continued training, they were uh, advanced endoscopists and only 22% were uh, in basic uh, the endoscopy training. And this means that the young trainees uh, were uh, being trained for basic endoscopy have been much more affected by the pandemic. And this will also be confirmed in uh, the next slide. As we can see here, we asked them, do you think your endoscopic skills regarding the procedures you are being trained for have been affected or not? And we had 61% of the participants asked yes. And uh, when you analyze the, the participants who, uh, who answered yes, 71% uh, of the participants were uh, advanced endoscopists, uh, sorry, uh, basic endoscopists, and only 29% were advanced. So it means also that the basic endoscopy training uh, trainees are being affected much more than the uh, who's in the advanced training. And um, finally, I would like to uh, acknowledge the uh, pre uh, Participation by okay, colleagues and investigators, and uh, thank you for your attention. So, thank you so much for your presentation, Omar. And now, I would like to also thank for this opportunity to present the results of our study, uh, considering the impact of COVID-19 on endoscopy trainees. And um, our, based on our study was uh, endotrain survey, uh, 37 item uh, endotrain survey, which was uh, uh, developed through a consensus by Indo international endotrain group. And our survey included a couple of main domains like um, monthly endoscopy volumes before and during COVID-19. We also asked about the opportunity to training and availability uh, of uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, we also ask about uh, alternative uh, sources of endoscopy uh, and of endoscopy education, and we ask about the impact on uh, physical, mental, and emotional well-being of endoscopy trainees. And those results we try to compare between continents. Uh, our study was approved by the Ethics Committee of ISM Tomeyer Hospital in Prague in Czech Republic, thanks to Jan Kral. 
Uh, and our study included the primary and secondary outcomes. And the primary outcome uh, was the percentage reduction in monthly volume of hands-on endoscopy procedures performed by trainees as a re result of COVID-19. And the secondary outcomes uh, were barriers to hands-on training and also the impact on residual training opportunities. We tried to estimate the changes to institutional case volume, uh, as well as uh, we tried to, uh, try to evaluate the training concerns regarding competency development and prolongation of training. And very important for us was to know what was the impact on anxiety and burnout level among endoscopy trainees. And we received the responses from 1,199 trainees from 63 countries and uh, 773 trainees completely filled the survey. Uh, the leading country were uh, United States, United Kingdom and also Spain. And the most of trainees were males. Uh, the, the most of trainees also performed basic procedures and the main speciality specialities were uh, pediatric and adult GI. And based on the results of our study, we could observe that COVID-19 has had a profound, profound adverse effect on endoscopy volume. Uh, we also observed that, uh, that uh, there were the drastic median reduction in case volume of 99% and about 93% uh, of trainees reported reductions in training opportunities. And on this figure, we can observe that in particular, all procedures were significantly reduced, especially colonoscopies. However, it wasn't varied by by, uh, for example, the type of specialty or the way of performed procedures, and I'm thinking here about supervised and independent procedures. And also our outcomes showed a variation between continents and the higher, the greatest percentage reduction was observed in the United States, Northern America, and also uh, in Europe uh, compared to Latin America and Asia. And also based on the results of our study, we could observe that about 60% of endoscopy trainees had access to endoscopy cases. However, uh, most of them perform procedures on low, low risk of cases uh, and about 7% uh, procedures, only 7% of procedures were performed unsupervised. Uh, and also some of cases were performed on ICU patients and, uh, and about 46% of trainees had access to emergency cases like, like bleeding. And also we tried to estimate uh, and ask what were the barriers for endoscopy training and what was the main reason uh, for worsening this training. And the main barrier was uh, were the restrictions in case volume uh, reported by 98% of trainees and about 73% of them reported also decrements higher than 50%. And the second uh, main barrier for training uh, was exclusion of trainees from endoscopy training. And there was many reasons. Uh, one of them was the lack of cases and it was about 50 percent. Uh, however, also 28 percent of them reported that the main reason was PPE shortage availability and also 24 percent of trainees reported that they were redeployment to different units, different departments without any opportunity for training. And all of those factors probably were associated with anxiety and burnout among endoscopy trainees and uh, independent factors related to anxiety were female gender, also adequacy of PPE and the lack of institutional support for emotional health. And what can we see here that about 90% of trainees reported concerns with competency acquisition and it was probably related to uh, eventual prolongation of training. So in conclusion, I would like to say that uh, based on our study, um, we could observe that COVID-19 has had a profound adverse effect on endoscopy training and also also on endoscopy trainees and very important was also to know how the situation worsed um, uh, emotional, physical and mental health of uh, endoscopy trainees. And here I would like to thank all of our participants of our survey and also uh, to all of our friends which helped us with the dissemination of the survey and, uh, and I would like to thank my fantastic group of, of friends uh, which helped us uh, with organization the study and, and for the study. And now uh, we have two questions for our webinars guests. 
guests. And the first question is because we, were, we are wondering uh, if routine endoscopy training has resumed in your unit. So please vote now. This is time for voting. And the same question I have uh, to you guys, Omar and Andre, and please tell me uh, how the situation uh, look, look in, your, in your unit. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Maybe from Andrei. my point, yeah, from my point, I have to say that there are definitely a lot of, I hope, a lot of trainees from our unit that are watching this. And uh, unfortunately for them, they still have not gone back to training after all these months. We are a designated COVID unit, and until it's decided otherwise, unfortunately, the trainees can't have hands-on endoscopic training. Also, same here. And Omar? Yeah. Also, we did not resume yet uh, the routine endoscopic training, and also this is because we, uh, our hospital is designated the uh, uh, hospital for COVID-19, and uh, um, it's still only uh, for emergencies and for already trained endoscopists. So, unfortunately, not. Mariana, what, so, what's going what's going on at your place? I'm sorry, Kasha, if I can just jump in, ask Mariana. <laughs> Well, we, we started um, uh, resuming our endoscopic activity uh, in the beginning of June. And uh, now we're almost 100% uh, of, our, of our routine endoscopic activity and our trainees uh, are back. Uh, there were a lot of them were deployed in the COVID units, but now it's, it's uh, maybe 90% like it was before for them. I'd, I'd say that's where we're at uh, as well right now. About the same timeline that you've yeah. taken as well. And, and you see that 61%, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, please continue, Andre. No, no, it's, it's very nice to see that, that the 61% have gone back to normal training, which is nice. Yes. Yeah, Although, on the other hand, 40% still have not, Yeah. which is interesting. We don't have the information, so but, but it'd be interesting to know where those 40% are or what, what's the, the background. We won't be able to get at that. I do want to remind the audience that if you do have questions, uh, please use the Q&A function. You can send those to Andre and myself, and we can send those questions on and ask our panelists. Kasha, go on. Okay, thank you so much. And now we have the second question uh, for our guests. Uh, so uh, please tell us what sort of content would help you the most in the following period of training. And I would like to hear, uh, this is time also for voting. And now I would like to also ask Andre and Omar, uh, what type of education, uh, what type of services uh, would you perform? And I would, uh, I would like to ask also um, Ian and Mariana, what for you is uh, the most important in the teaching way? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there are a lot of re great resources out there and we'll uh, get back to them at the end of the presentation. For myself, it's been very interesting, even if I am part of DSG for some time now that I've discovered a lot of interesting content online, especially the ESG tutor and the uh, basic uh, uh, videos in basic endoscopy. Those are very actually quite useful, even for more advanced endoscopic mm -hmm. trainees or fellows. Yes, I think also I, I have watched a lot of... Uh, uh, recorded demonstrations over uh, EGE uh, library and also different to uh, attending different webinars uh, from EGE uh, webinar series and other webinars also. So this is, I think this is what I have done already in these few months till now. Okay, so we can see here that um, the most favorite because about 38% of all sources um, live recorded demonstration was per, were performed and was per, were preferred. And also on this, in the second place, we have webinars. So that's good news for us. That's good news for us. So maybe now is the time for, the, uh, for Mariana and for, uh, for Andre to continue the presentation. Yeah, so uh, we're moving on. Ariana? Yep. So um, before uh, talking about um, how to get our mojo back, maybe we should get into the, how we get the mojo in the, the different steps and the modalities of, of training. And uh, traditionally, it's, uh, it's a master and apprentice uh, uh, model of training. Uh, it may seem uh, outdated, but it's efficient and it's still ongoing. Uh, but we can understand that it's not 
always possible and it's definitely not possible during a pandemic crisis that the one that we've uh, gone through and we're going still through um, and and uh, it's interesting to go through all these steps uh, that's what you learn when you learn uh, endoscopic procedure and this is a very interesting um, article by John Anderson that was published in 2018 where he really explores the different steps and challenges in, in acquiring in, in, in endoscopic procedure and uh, this is a table which shows all the different skills uh, that are required to, uh, to have a, a safe and effective uh, therapeutic procedure and you can see that you have of course your technical skills but that's not the only ones you have that's not only manual skills but you also have lesion recognition also you have uh, decision making judgment knowing your li lim your limits by self-awareness and of course you have your technical skills uh, as well but we can see here that, uh, for example, you may have less polyps to resec, but you can still uh, watch, for example, a live demo, uh, practice, practice yourself on uh, characterizing that polyp, maybe uh, proposing a, a resection type and strategy, and uh, uh, still continue to learn uh, during these times. And the, the, all the, the training, the training period is on a timeline. This has been very nicely described by the Japanese, uh, where you can first start by observing, and then you will start assisting and gaining familiarity with the procedure by being next to the person that's doing it. Then you will start practice. And in, in Japan, they will practice on animal models. You will start doing supervised cases. And then uh, finally, you will have your independent practice. We can imagine that uh, these steps will be influenced by uh, the pandemic, but you can still practice, maybe not on animal models, but we will find other resources uh, to continue to learn. During this whole timeline, we know that your competence will be assessed in a normal training period. This is done by thresholds, uh, learning curves, and now we are using uh, what we call direct observation formative assessments, or like DOPS, uh, where you score your skills. This will include technical, but not only. It will also have cognitive and what we call NT. ENTS, which is basically endoscopic non-technical skills. And in there you will find as well uh, knowledge by, for example, uh, um, uh, characterizing a lesion, but also um, decision-making, uh, patient management, and uh, also uh, team communication, uh, and uh, or what we call soft skills. So uh, again, another proof that it's not only technical skills, but cognitive skills also are important. And finally, how is this competence acquired? We talked about uh, the supervised patient-based training with the timeline. We know that at this point, this is not possible or it's very limited. We have simulation-based training. So you can do that with, with live animals if this will be highly unlikely, unless you have a very nifty animal lab, or if you're doing it on your dog or cat, which is discouraged, you will have hands-on with exploited animal models, like the, the animal models we have on our ESG hands-on uh, stations. But all this as well is highly unlikely to happen during this period. And you also have mechanical simulators or uh, virtual reality simulators. But again, as we saw from our 100 and more participants, zero had the opportunity uh, to use the simulators in, in our center. For example, we cannot offer this to our trainees. So this is also extremely rare. But in any case, you still have uh, possibilities. You can have uh, skill development tools. Uh, you can do this by yourself. Uh, you can take a box, make some holes in it, and try to, to use it to uh, de develop your, your navigation skills. Uh, you can also uh, use observation. We saw in the... Um, in the survey that recorded live demos uh, were very popular. And you can see these demos, watch them, observe, and try to simulate what would you do? Uh, how would you uh, manage uh, the, the case at that time? Also, uh, e-learning with questions and answers and self-assessment, like our ESG tutors, are very helpful to establish uh, pre-required knowledge and also to, to learn new things, maybe in domains that you, you, you're not very uh, aware of. 
And finally, webinars, uh, live lectures, questions and answer sessions, and why not, maybe some old fashioned reading an article, you know, on, on paper, and maybe so some ESG guidelines that slipped through the last year. It will be a very good opportunity to use this time, if you have it, to go back to these, uh, to these um, uh, sources. So I'm going to pass the floor or the screen to Andre, who is going to show what's going on when you're gonna jump on the saddle back again and resume your training and also some interesting and innovating tips and tricks of how to implement these, these sources of knowledge. Okay, so thanks, uh, you. Andre. Yeah. Let, let me jump in. I just want sure. to the audience there. Are, actually, I'm going to let you do this, but there's some really good questions that some people have already sent in, and we're going to get to those questions as soon as yeah. you finish these next few slides. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Ian. And thanks, Mariana. Now, uh, this image has by now, of course, become a staple and uh, many restrictive measures were predicated upon the notion that if we intervene here and very forcefully at the beginning of the pandemic, we can flatten the curve and that this, of course, will translate into a better outcome, less stress on the healthcare system. So we're all familiar with this. However, uh, the effect of flattening the curve can also be, uh, is also obvious in a minute, I'm just... And it's also obvious in another curve that we're very interested in as trainees or mentors, which is the learning curve. Again, this is something we're familiar with. Advancing on the learning curve from the very beginning to competency and even uh, proficiency is, of course, influenced by the caseloads and the volumes of your work. It's not the only issue, but it's a very important issue. So, of course, the majority of trainees are normally stressed out by the fact that their learning curves is, all, is also getting flattened. And furthermore, once you've reached proficiency or a stable level, there is also the risk of uh, resetting or uh, of starting a downward slope on a forgetting curve. This actually is translated into literature as skill decay, and everything we have to do now is to prevent skill decay. Now, of course, a long period of time without hands-on training is detrimental, that is obvious. However, there, is, there are some positive uh, uh, signals from the literature. For example, there was a study published in 2013 that uh, checked out exactly what happens to trainees after a period of inactivity, lasting up to eight weeks, no more than that. And uh, that's, that study has shown that there is a statistically significant skill decay, but not very important, and it's very easy to get back on the saddle once you start working again. Okay, so that's very nice, and hopefully we've seen that some of, uh, some of you have gone back to the a normal flow of things. What can your mentor do during this period to, uh, to help you progress and get back on the saddle? Of course, we have to be careful. The pandemic is still going on. It's here to stay, probably for the foreseeable future at least. So we have to take care of the personnel. We have to limit the procedures, but we have to match the procedure to the trainee. So it's more than likely that if you have gone back to work again, there are certain procedures that are at, as yet off bounds to you. And this has to be determined by the, by the mentor who has to define clear aims at the outset of each procedure. It would be nice if you could set a time limit so you don't have unnecessary exposure and drag on the procedure. Uh, the mentor has to focus, of course, on the trainee's immediate goals and allow ample time for discussion after each case because that's when a lot of the learning and teaching actually happens. And this is a personal point, but perhaps, and I'm sure many units are doing this, if you are starting out a new technique acquisition, it's probably best if you don't start right now and you just postpone it, at least temporarily, because it's also not likely that you'd get a high enough volume, and that's very important in the beginning phase of, uh, of your learning curve. Maybe simulators would be a better option for this particular point. And of course, what can you do now? We know nothing can beat hands-on uh, procedures. That's the best. That's what we all want to do. But as uh, Mariana has said, maybe now it's a good time to uh, advance and progress on our non-technical skills because technical skills, psychomotor skill is only part of the equation. We also need to develop correct attitudes and we need to develop our knowledge, know when to do the procedure, 
what to do when things go wrong, how to discuss with the patient afterwards, how to integrate this into a, into a complete plan. Of course, we can observe our mentors or uh, people who are working if we are not working at the moment. We can discuss each case in depth if the mentor has time for that. Uh, looking back at the direct observation of procedural skill or DOPS, this is something that is very popular, especially in the UK. They've pioneered it. There are um, uh, assessment tools that are generally used to determine competency thresholds for uh, trainees, but maybe we can turn this around and judge our mentors, of course, in a, uh, uh, in a, in a funny way, if you want. We can discuss each point, and that way we can get more familiar with DOPS, and in, in that particular point, we can become uh, more proficient once we go back to work. Of course, there are many resources out there that are available for you, and these are just uh, some of the top of my head that we've uh, discussed and that we'd encourage you to look at. There is the Endoscopy Campus site, which has very nice material, and uh, they also have webinars. And there is the Best Academia EU. This is a site that is dedicated to Barrett's esophagus, and it also has histopathology and in-depth discussion. So this is something that I would recommend for you to do. You can also check out various free online atlases, since of course trainees are interested also in what is normal, what is basic, and you, there, is, there are surprisingly few resources about that online. You can look at the YouTube channel. For example, the American College of Gastroenterology has a nice uh, YouTube channel. And last but not least, there is our very own My ESG Tutor, which I've also checked out during this period. And I think it's a very comprehensive way to uh, get in depth into some of the, the things you actually encounter in, in real practice. And then, if you can, you can build your own simulator, which is something that uh, we have done, not during the pandemic, but before. So we have some experience with this in, uh, in my unit. Of course, you need a space, you need an older model, you don't need the the newest uh, top of the line endoscope for this and maybe it's not even uh, uh, good for your mentor to teach you on the best if you can start working on uh, on an older machine you definitely can move up from there you need some for this gastric model for example we've used some plastic tubing that is accessible at any hardware store you need to get in touch with a good butcher and become friendly with him so that he can provide you with uh, the material and here we see this stomach which is very nice adapted to the machine and here we can see the effect of working uh, after a prolonged period of time these are very happy mentors and fellows so this is something if you have these resources which are available in most units this is something you can do for improvement of your psychomotor skills okay so that brings us to the end of uh, my presentation at least and i we can start uh, discussing them more in depth so Andre, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the other presenters. I do want to get to a few questions that I'm going to uh, throw at the panel here. There's one interesting question here is, is anybody, are your programs considering prolonging the training period for the fellows since they've missed out on some of their training or even changing the admission dates to bring in new fellows into your program? Is that happening anywhere? It's not at our place, at least not yet. Mariana? No, not in our place either, because it was uh, uh, for for the time being. It's been uh, it's been less than uh, eight weeks, uh, so uh, uh, it's it's considered that the training that will, they have available will be enough, and it it will not implicate a lot for the future. But we still don't know what's going to happen. O Omar or Kasha. Uh, our uh, admission and uh, pro uh, training program is a little bit different, so I think the, this will not affect somehow uh, how they will progress in training. So in, uh, in, in Egypt here, it's a little bit different. So, so I think it will not affect their uh, training curve. So it's, they, they will deduct this period from the training and continue as this uh, has been imposed or something like this. So it will not affect them. Yes. Yeah, Kasha? same here. Yeah, same here, like, like in Omar country. Okay. So, uh, I, I have to say that, uh, at least in my country, where, as I've said, it's more than three months since some uh, trainees have touched the endoscope, at least in my unit. I don't know about the other units in, uh, in Romania, but I think it's a generalized problem. Uh, I'm, not so, mm, I'm not so confident that things uh, 
will progress naturally from now on. So we are very concerned and the, the fellows are very concerned about what's going to happen to them. Because okay. three months, four months, five months out of your fellowship, that's a lot. So that, that matters. And we don't have an official uh, uh, standpoint on this so far. Yeah, and, and, and it's different now. Different places in the world are in different phases of this pandemic. Whether it's still, whether currently now in Latin America and North America, it's still basically out of control. In Europe, it's more under control and more of a post lockdown. But I think nobody knows exactly where this is all going to go. Kasha, there's actually a specific question for you. Uh, they want to know, somebody wants to know, in your opinion, uh, the educational value of structured conversations on Twitter regarding endoscopy, specifically scoping Sundays. What are your thoughts? Yes, yes. I think the, the Twitter uh, has become the new tool for education and there is a lot of uh, initiatives, especially Scoping Sundays, uh, prepared by Mohammed Bilal from, from Harvard and the rest of fellows from United States. And this is uh, actual, actually a very nice tool because you have the, uh, the main topic uh, each Sunday and they can discuss the very nice, uh, nice things and there is a lot of tricks and tips considered the uh, the way of learning and the way of uh, performing uh, some type of some some type of procedures so so i think this is a very good way uh, for learning for young endoscopies and also for for all to check uh, what's going on, on on this field so yes okay great andre uh question for you specifically uh yeah. do you do you, re do you recommend mobile endoscopy learning apps or games like Gastro X for novices? And if so, do you think the skills learned on these types of apps actually transfer to the clinical setting? I feel well, very old because I have no clue what Gastro X is. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> I, 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 I have to say, I won't be much help with this question. So uh, I, I also feel quite old. Again, if, if it's, if it's uh, for novices, I think, and this is what all the studies have shown, simulators or games or apps like this, can be very helpful at the beginning of the learning curve. Uh, further on, they lose some of their significance. But maybe, uh, Katajina, maybe you can, or Omar, you can enlighten us on this, uh, on this mobile yeah. apps. I'm, I'm not familiar with them, I have to say. Are you familiar, is anybody else familiar with these at all? Yes, me, uh, yeah. I know this. this is, so that, that's this why is what I got social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, this is what I recommended my friends from, from Poland and from Polish Society of Young Endoscopists. And I think this is very good uh, before you're starting performing some procedures because you have so many levels with the different type of, of procedures like colonoscopy, cutting polyps, um, like APC and different, different, many different procedures. And I think this is good. Uh, for beginners, when do you know uh, when you don't know exactly what is going on in with in colonoscopy or even in endoscopy, and maybe yes, this is a good way of learning. Uh, also with um, with movies and and different different sources. Uh, however, also I would like to highlight that uh, simulators and also some uh, some even boxes like Ostamania model or or also we have some sim similar model in in Canada Walsh box. This is very good way for training and this, this can be continuity for trainees, uh, for beginners train, trainees. So if they start it, they can con continue on this. But the problem is, I think, with more advanced, uh, more, more advanced uh, um, trainees. And this is my question for you, uh, my, Mariana and Ian. What to do when you started before COVID learning more advanced procedures and mm -hmm. what to do now with this? Because probably it's not possible to continue. So what is the, the way of, of dealing with this. Mariani, you want to start? Well, uh, as you said, Akasha, it's, it's the, the, all these, these the stimulators the, and the apps that are good for the, for the, the first 25 procedures for the novices. When you're already advanced uh, and you have no possibility of doing uh, uh, patient supervised uh, training, I think that you there's not a lot of possibilities. You, uh, you have to get the best of what you have available. So I think that uh, trying to uh, um, enhance the other uh, aspects of, 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 uh, of uh, endoscopic training, uh, like the knowledge, like um, 
uh, these non-technical parts are, uh, this is the time that you're going to do this and you go in depth with it, uh, as well as uh, continue to learn. Uh, even if you're uh, in your, uh, ad not novice, but you're in your advanced training, you might still uh, improve your, your knowledge on polyp detection and characterization or um, the different uh, complications you might have after your CP. And all these can be done by uh, just watching uh, uh, procedures or, uh, or e even just reading some, uh, some published uh, articles. Mm -hmm. What do you I, think, I, I, yeah, I would agree with that. I think mm. that there's, I think it's an opportunity to uh, improve cognitive skills, um, lesion recognition, uh, watch videos. There's lots of videos. If, if you search online, um, all different types of procedures, YouTube, there, there's tons of stuff out there. Um, I did a search and if you, if you have the capability and, and you have the drive, uh, and you do want to work on your technical skills, even if you put in something like, how do I build my own GI endoscopy model? There are websites out there that show you how to build different models for technical skills. So um, th there's a whole myriad of, of things you can actually really do. It doesn't fully supplant the actual patient care and the activity. Um, but we are in a period in the world where we just sort of have to adapt, just like what we're doing tonight with all these webinars and, and these types of sessions. Uh, we need to just learn how to adapt to the current situation and, and we'll get through it. Um, I'll, just add one, I'll just add one other thing. Again, looking at this as an opportunity is, of course, very sound advice. And some of our uh, trainees have actually become much more involved in research during this period. So you have a lot of downtime. And this, this of course, is another thing that you can do. And uh, there is a question. Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. I, I think we, we have a placing of the, uh, that you have a little bit more time than usual. So if you are going training in the regular times, you will have uh, much less time than now. So I think now we, uh, we have uh, a little bit more time. Sometimes uh, you can you make use of it of, uh, in reinforcing other skills like Mariana and Ian said, and uh, I think we can look uh, from the side that this is a, a positive point somehow, and uh, reinforce what we uh, have and we can do now, and uh, prepare for the uh, technical skills uh, l later on. So you you improve your uh, knowledge, you improve your uh, uh, ability to characterize uh, uh, diagnose lesions. I think this is what uh, we can do at the moment here. Yeah. Um, th there's a couple of questions. This is a little bit different right now, but there are a couple of individuals asked about uh, the current role of use of PCR, pre-endoscopy testing. Is anybody doing uh, pre-endoscopy PCR testing looking for COVID? Um, and uh, we're not. Mariana, what we, are you guys we, doing? We stopped. We did it in the beginning when we started our, uh, uh, our, our routine uh, uh, endoscopy programs. Everybody that was uh, scheduled for uh, endoscopy with, you know, with anesthesia and intubation, because we do a lot of the, the therapeutic procedures under general anesthesia, they were all, uh, they were all uh, tested. But at one point, it really depends on your epidemiology in your country, because at one right. point we had, uh, we had very few, like 1% of asymptomatic uh, PCR positive patients. So we decided to stop doing this and we only do the clinical questionnaire with the clinical symptoms. And if that's positive, then we test the patient and he, we, we, we don't do the procedure if it's an elective procedure. But it really depends on uh, the, the rate of your asymptomatic carriers. Correct, and that's what we're doing too. What about Omar, Andre, what are you guys doing right now? Actually, we, we from the beginning, the, we are doing the uh, clinical questions and we, uh, we ask if the patient has uh, uh, any symptoms or, uh, or the patient have uh, uh, been in, uh, engage with somebody who is infected or, uh, or something like this. And uh, we do this triage and uh, if the patient is suspected, we refer to the uh, unit for, dedicated for the uh, COVID-19. And uh, if not, uh, the patient is allowed for endoscopy. So we do just questionnaire before the procedures mm -hmm. and that's it from the beginning. Andre, you're in a different situation a little bit because you're in a COVID only hospital, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, yes. So in the hospital, we only see confirmed patients. But uh, I know from other sources and from private practice that generally they work with a questionnaire. And the procedures that happen at other hospitals happen only after a negative PCR. 
So in hospitals, more advanced procedures require a negative test, whereas private practice just goes through cash questionnaire and open access endoscopy works like that. Kasha, are you guys doing pre-endoscopy PCR testing? Yes, we are performing. This is, this is the one of restriction in my hospital and all of patients had PCR before each procedures, even if it Maybe when the situation is very difficult and, and with this, this patient from from emergency room, uh, there is possibility to do the procedure without any PCR. But mainly patients, mostly m main group of patients had PCR before. This is the day before uh, before admission, and and this is it. Now we are working this way. Okay, um, it's sort of an opportunity here to, to plug, there, there's now a position statement, I think it may be out online. This is part two of the ESG position statement. It's on COVID and endoscopy and it's during the post uh, lockdown period. And we address some of these issues, but it's such a rapidly evolving and changing area uh, almost on a daily basis, but we do give some guidance to our community uh, about this, about uh, pre-endoscopy testing and the role of PCR, et cetera. I have a question for you. Is anybody in your units, are you testing the healthcare personnel in the endoscopy units? Are doctors being to, tested? Are nurses being tested routinely? We have, uh, we have uh, serology testing now. Okay. We started that and uh, surprisingly, or maybe non-surprisingly, a lot of, uh, of our colleagues and the nurses that, were, um, that definitely did the disease because they had, were PCR positive at one point, they don't have any antibodies. So very, very low uh, rate of positivity in the, in the antibody testing. Anybody else for healthcare personnel? Yeah, so no, no. here in, in, my hospital, in my hospital we have serology tests and also PCR is possible, but this is not routine. This is the only right. option. Same with us. Uh, we're not doing uh, PCR testing routinely. They did do some serology testing a week or so ago or a couple weeks ago where they took 100 healthcare personnel from the hospital just randomly. I don't think anybody from our department was tested. Zero. Zero yeah. had antibodies. Yeah. Nobody out of the 100. <laughs> Um, let me see. There's another there, question that yeah. just came in. Did you see that, Andre? Want you take yeah, that there, question? There, there's a question here. If there is a place for enhanced training after the pandemic is under control, and this is a very good question, especially since a lot of programs, for the example, the ESG has uh, training grants that have been postponed. So the question is, where will this enhanced training happen after the pandemic? Maybe oh, Maria, you can, Mariana, you can take that. Well, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's true that we, we don't really know how things are going to ha go on because even if you, you, we don't have the COVID problem anymore, um, we, 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 still, we still have patients to take care of and not everybody can go on doing training everywhere. Uh, at some point, and, uh, and there will be no, no, no basic patient care. So um, regarding the fellowship uh, grants, the, the, the problem is, of course, that a lot of the, the present, present fellowship grants that were scheduled for this year have to be uh, scheduled next year. So we're going to have a back, backload of, 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 of uh, uh, fellowships to, uh, to put, to arrange with the host units. So this, this might be a problem to offer enhanced training afterwards. We won't be able to help everybody. Okay. Uh, there are also uh, two more questions here. Now, is it your opinion that uh, the fellow year must be repeated? The, I mean, the fellowship year, I think, or just uh, prolonged after the official end? I think this is going to vary widely according to the national regulations and the national situation. There is not, nothing official, in, at least in our healthcare system. Maybe someone else has uh, official news um, of this? No, but maybe, maybe this is like 
It depends on, on the way of your specialization, because in Poland we have, uh, during the gastroenterology GI specialization, you should perform the number of procedures. And maybe this is the reason why some fellows had concerns regarding to this. And you have, for example, I don't remember, but you have number for colonoscopies, for gastroscopies, for, for polypectomies. And maybe this is the reason why, uh, why are they generally concerning about this. We have, we have the same thing that you have to have a certain number of examinations that you have to demonstrate over the period of your training. Uh, so this may become an issue. I don't know yet. It's going to depend, I think, what plays out during the course of somebody's training time. But at this point, at least where, where I'm at, this, has, this issue has not yet come up, but it may come up in the future. And it may be a very relevant issue for some of our trainees. Um, there, there's another question I think that, that was asked uh, that, that's also important in terms of uh, P, PPE and what are we doing? You know, if you're not testing somebody before and you're just, you know, are you sort of assuming everybody's potentially positive and are just, are you always assuming you have adequate supply of PPE? What are you using right now? And I'll, I'll start with, I'm just going to go by the screen here. Mariana, what are you routinely using for PPE? So we have the basic, uh, the, the surgical mask, and uh, now we started using goggles and the hairnet because we, this, at least one good thing about the pandemic is that it's kind of like uh, woke us up on the use of protective equipment because I don't know how you were doing this before, but we just wore gloves and then we were just going, doing our thing, not paying much attention. And now we understood that we have to protect ourselves because you have other viruses or other you know, contam contamination possibilities. And so now we have surgical masks and goggles and of course gloves. And uh, the, uh, the, the level two is only for uh, highly suspicious or confirmed uh, COVID cases because we don't have enough. We still don't have enough of this kind of equipment. That's what we're doing too. Omar, what are you guys doing? Actually, uh, we uh, started to use uh, gowns and uh, face shields together with, um, according to the availability, N95 uh, with the pyrometer uh, masks or ju just normal surgical masks. But to, uh, at any case, we use face shields to, uh, with it and uh, over our shoes. And uh, sometimes we uh, uh, also we, we adopted double gloves techniques. So we always use double gloves. And um, uh, according to the availability, sometimes N95 is not available. We use a surgical mask together with the face shields. So, Kasha? So like Mariana and like Omar, we have face shields, gloves and surgical mask. And I think we don't have this serious problem right now because all patients are tested. So, so this is mainly for, for personal protective, but, but like Omar and Mariana, exactly. Andre? Yeah, yeah it's, it's the same for us. It varies from uh, institution to institution, but generally we all have face shields, double gloves and a surgical or an N95 mask. And of course a gown. Uh, now I have a question. Do you, do you think this uh, protective equipment uh, encumbers you? Well, of course it does, but do you think it affects your performance or, uh, for example, seeing through the face shield or the goggles or spending a lot of time in a protective equipment can be very, very difficult to, uh, yeah. for, the, for the endoscopist? You get used to it, I think. <laughs> I, I think uh, it, it, it's, not, it's not an overly enjoyable experience because the goggles can fog up from the mask. It, it's, we're not, like, like Mariana said, we, we weren't as nearly aware of use of, of PPE before this. Um, and I think, and, and especially a lot, the gowns that are waterproof, they don't breathe well and you sweat and it's hot and it's not, it's, I don't have any data to show that it, imp you know, it impairs our, our technical skills or, or what we're doing, but it's not nearly as nice as it used to be. Let's put it that way. But it's, it's a necessity today. That's a, again, this is the, the way of the world right now. Um, we have a few more slides here uh, to wrap up. Uh, any final comments from any of the panelists or from my co-moderator, Andre? 
Well, I think this was very, a very productive uh, discussion, and I hope that uh, the people who have uh, watched us have go home with a, with a positive message. And hopefully we'll uh, see each other again soon, not only in a webinar format, which uh, can be difficult at times. And, and that's a good segue into maybe some of these other uh, slides here. So I'm just going to remind everybody once again, I think it's a great uh, opportunity. If you're not a member of ESGE, please join, especially trainees. It's a great, uh, it's a great low price and you get a lot of benefit from it, including, of course, uh, the journal. And uh, next slide. And if you are in a country that has a dual membership agreement and you join, uh, it's even cheaper. It's 150 instead of 195 if you're not a trainee. These are the, these are the various, the 23 member societies that have such a dual membership agreement. Next. Um, this recording is going to be posted on the website. So if you want to look at it again, check it out, go to the ESG website. All the other past webinars are there as well. I want to thank the uh, governing board. I want to thank the secretariat, especially Claire and Dave, as well as uh, Maria and Veronica. Thank you for helping us with the webinar. Next Wednesday, uh, uh, ESG webinar Wednesdays, next Wednesday, the 22nd at uh, 7 p.m. is going to be the ESG, ESGE Days 2020 Innovation of the Year Awards and the Most Innovative Paper. This was supposed to have been done at Dublin, but uh, of course, because we didn't meet face-to-face, -face, we're going to do it as a webinar. Uh, Mario, Denise Ribeiro, and Peter Sirsima are going to be the moderators, and uh, we have a great uh, group of panelists as well. And talking about being online, ESG Connect 2020, September 21st, we're going to be doing a full day of online uh, it's a great program. Uh, everything endoscopy from basic endoscopy to advanced endoscopy. It allows all of us to connect together, to uh, share our ideas, and come together as a community in the ESGE. So again, that's Monday, September 21st. It's from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Central European time, ESG Connect. You can find more information about it in the program at the ESG website. And last but not least, ESG days. Uh, we are very, very hopeful. We're going to be getting together face-to-face -to -face, um, in Berlin in March of 2021. Hopefully, uh, things will begin to uh, go in the, in the right direction, and we'll all be meeting face-to-face -face for ESG days in Berlin, March 25th to 27th, and I hope to see all of you there. And... Uh, Last but not least, I want to thank all of our corporate partners who have been very, very supportive during this very difficult period of time. Our premium partners, our major partners, our general partners. ESG very much wants to thank all of you for your uh, assistance and support. Without you guys, uh, these types of uh, educational programs couldn't happen, so we're very appreciative of that. So thank you very much. And with that, I, I want to thank Andrea as the co-moderator and the uh, I committee chair. You, you did a great job putting this together. Kasha, Omar, uh, as two other members of the, of the I committee, thank you very much for all of your input. It was great. It was great to have you guys here now doing webinars with us. And Mariana, you and I are the old, old fogies on, on the team here. And uh, I thank you very much for being here uh, as well and representing the older generation. <laughs> Yes, we're still there. <laughs> yeah, we're still here. We're still and, here. and now we know gastro X as well. <laughs> yes, we do. I'm going to look it up right after. Yeah, we have to look at it. <laughs> it's Absolutely. not bad. I just checked it out. It's not bad. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. All right. Okay, thank then. you all very much. And uh, I wish all of you thanks for joining us and have a great rest of your evening. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.